Welcome back, everybody. Joe Everest, the fence expert. If you've watched any of my other review videos, you know what you're in for. Jeremy picks out videos from the YouTube universe that uh, he thinks that I'd like to react to or review. Reviews typically have a positive spin. We all know how many negative reviews are out there in YouTube land, and I'd like to change that. So without further review, here we go. This is Joe Everest, the fence expert. My family's been perfecting their way of building fence for over 60 years, three generations. While there's more than one way to build a fence, I'm here to share with you our way. All right, guys, so today's video is titled Black Chain Link Fence Installation, Dog Park Installation, How to DIY. It's by Mastering Mayhem. So we did a video a little while back talking about the different fittings that are used in a chain link fence, and that fence happened to be a black coated chain link fence. So we got a lot of questions about, you know, is the installation process different? How does it, you know, how do you install a black coated chain link fence? So we haven't had a project come up that was black coated chain link fence, but Jeremy found this video and said they did a pretty good job. So let's check it out. Midland, Texas, we're setting up to install a 25 foot by 25 foot dog park right here in this area. You know, and those are becoming more and more common, the small dog parks in an apartment complex. Uh, we haven't seen them become, we haven't seen them built with black coated chain link. Typically here in our area, uh, they go for galvanized or ornamental aluminum if it's a nicer apartment complex. Uh, but yeah, you're seeing these more and more, that apartment complexes are coming up with these dog parks. Show you guys how to mark out the lines, get the main corner posts and the support posts where they need to be. But we're going to show you how to put in these four foot chain link fence uh, for dog park, but it's for an apartment complex here. Nathan, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. We did the three, four, five method where the corner posts here on one of the corners of the fence set up. We measured out three feet here and then four feet to the next spike. When it's three feet this way, four feet that way, to make sure that this triangle is square, it's got to be five feet between the two spikes. That's a great tip, the Pythagorean theorem. We did a video on it, a review video on some guys doing the Pythagorean theorem a little while back, three, four, five method. Uh, it's a great method. And the nice thing is it's scalable, right? So if you have if you have a project that's a thousand foot one way and a thousand foot the other way, you could do 30 foot, 40 foot, 50 foot to make sure that corner is very precisely 90 degrees. Uh, it's a great it's a great tip. So if you guys are out there trying to square a corner, three foot, four foot, that one leg is three foot, one leg is four foot, the diagonal should be five foot, and you know you're square. So once you have that five feet between the two spikes, after you do three feet one way, four feet the other, that is going to be straight square lines all the way down to our 25 foot mark there at that, that little spike. Now that we got this marked, we're going to go ahead and take this, this spike out of this spike and do three, four feet there, make sure it's five feet, and then we go on to the next corner, the next corner, and then we're going to have a squared out uh, fence. There. And then if you have a bigger or longer fence lines, you got to do 50 foot lengths or 100 foot lengths. All you have to do is double the uh, Pythagorean equation here where it's three, four, five, then you double it to six, eight, 10, or then you double it to 12, 16, 20, and so on and so forth. All right, y'all, we got everything squared up with the string. I don't know how well you can see it there, but we got our... So one comment on the string line, um, what we would typically do is we would do our string line or our layout a foot outside of the fence line. So instead of 25 foot, it'd be 27 foot, right? So 25 foot leg, and then a foot outside on each side. The reason being, then you don't have to worry about moving the string to dig the holes. You can simply measure 12 inches off the string when you're setting your post. As long as it hits 12 inches on the string, you know your post is in line. Um, with this way, I have a feeling they're probably going to have to either mark and then move the lines. Uh, the line's going to have to be out of the way somehow because the line right now is exactly where that fence is going. Square in place. Now we're going to mark the different, uh, about eight foot, eight foot distances between the corner posts and the support posts of the fabric. The longest distance you can go between support posts for the top rail is 10 feet. 25 feet, we got two support posts on each side here. And then these guys are only going to get one support post because that's where the gate area is going to be. You'll see what I'm talking about there. But yeah. So that's a good point. So when you're dealing with chain link fence, 
uh, the maximum length between uh, either terminal post and line post or between two line posts is 10 foot or less. Uh, so in this one, it sounds like he's, he's, he's spacing them at eight foot intervals. Um, yeah, so the standard is 10 foot or less on line post spacing. We're going to mark it with a high vis paint. At every post, every support post we have marked right here with the high vis. So this kind of is, this kind of illustrates why this is dangerous using colored paint. So he's using orange paint, but what we just saw get panned over was an orange marking, a utility marking. Uh, orange denotes communication. So it can be anything from uh, coax to just, you know, telephone, two pair, four pair, whatever, telephone. But it can also be fiber optic. Fiber optics used for communication. Uh, so it would be really easy if you're using bright orange to lay out your fence line, but there's also bright orange utility lines right, right in line with this fence. Uh, it might be easy to confuse the two. So white is used to denote proposed excavation. It's what color we use so that our guys know if it's white paint, it's ours. If it's any sort of color, it's not ours. It's a utility. Uh, another conversation is that he's well within two foot of that utility marking. Um, now they're in, I believe he said they're in Texas maybe. Um, so Texas, I'm not sure what, what the standoff distance is in Missouri you legally have to stand off a utility, marked utility two foot on either side or be liable for any damages. Uh, so if you stay outside of that two foot, you know, no dig zone on either side of the paint, if you stay outside of that and you do hit a utility line, you're not liable for damages. Uh, but in this instance, it looks like he's only a matter of inches off of it. If he happens to hit that line, then he would be responsible for any damages. Visibility paint. These guys are all marked. Actually, not only do we have all the support posts, the corner posts, and the bigger two and five eighths inch posts that hold the gates, we have even the support little six inch hole that we drill here. I don't know if you guys see it, but it's going to be a little eight foot by eight foot square. This is going to be the off leash area where the, they take the dogs off leash, and then we just put a little straight mark across the opening. You know, and knowing that he's using orange paint, that the line might actually line the market that we're looking at might actually be when he laid this project out with the customer and see guys, that's the confusing part about this, right? Is that he obviously knows cause he put paint on the ground, but anybody else that walks up doesn't know is that a utility line that he's getting ready to dig right on top of, or is that just his layout markings? Like I said, we use white paint to denote proposed excavation. Um, we usually mark it out before the utility locators come out. So they see our, proposed layout to let us know if there's any problems. I mean, if you're painting the day of the project, maybe there's not as much risk there. But anyway, like I said, using the proper color paint can take away a lot of uh, confusion. Where the gate's going to be here and here. Again, we're going to take down the line and we'll start drilling holes with the little beaver that's just waiting there in the sun to get to work. Those little beavers are good equipment. We used to use them quite a lot. Um, Probably six or seven years ago, we started upgrading our equipment to uh, mini skid steers or mini skid units. Uh, but I tell you what, those little beavers, they do some work. So, you know, if you're out there in the DIY crowd, you're looking to rent a piece of equipment, those little beavers. I don't see them as often, though, in the rental houses. Typically, you see a, the uh, Toro Dingo. Uh, but if you find a little beaver, they are good digging equipment. Okay, everyone, we're starting off with the 10-inch auger for the terminal posts here. This is going to hold most of the, these posts will be holding most of the weight of the fence. Basically, it's going to be holding the fabric of the fence. It's going to be holding the brackets that hold the fabric. It's going to be holding the top rails. It's going to be holding the gates. So we want to make sure the holes are wide enough and deep enough. And as far as width, uh, whatever posts you're putting in the ground, you have to have the hole be at least three times the width of those posts. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, he is absolutely spot on. So... The standard is three times the diameter of the post is your post hole size. Uh, but he's taking that a step further, uh, which is always a good idea. If there's ever a question, go bigger as far as the hole and the, and the amount of concrete you're using. Uh, he's, he's absolutely right. The, ten, the terminal posts are going to have all of the stress and strain of that fence uh, and the gates. So you, you want to oversize those holes because the worst thing you could possibly do is undersize them have them then lean and you have to go back and try to repair or replace 
uh, that particular post. And then you're going to end up digging a bigger hole anyway. So cry once, dig a bigger hole once, and be done with it. Um, and I also found that for the bigger terminal post holes, it took about one and a half to two bags of the 80-pound concrete or quickcrete um, material. So for the six-inch holes, it took about a third to one half of the 80-pound bags of concrete or quickcrete. So keep that in mind. Uh, this park, I think, took about 28 bags of quickcrete of the 80-pound quickcrete. That's a good ratio. Uh, so for for terminals, ends, gate posts, the larger posts, we figure on two bags per hole. Uh, now on the line posts, we we typically use an eight, an eight inch auger, um, two and a half foot deep, and those usually take one bag of concrete. So one bag per line post, two bags for terminal end or gate post. Uh, one thing to help you drill a little bit better into like hard or rocky ground instead of using a rock breaker is to get a more powerful auger. Uh, this is the Groundhog HD99. I highly recommend getting that one. The, it'll work better than the 5.5 horsepower little beaver that we're using here. So we had the engine clutch out a few times when it hit a rock which wasn't even that big. And so it got a little frustrating. We didn't know if it was the bit itself or the little beaver. But uh, we sure would have liked to have used one with a little more horsepower. And you can get better bits too. And here we're using a 6 inch bit for the uh, line posts and then as you can see the rock breaker is still being used even with the six inch holes we figured if we were using a narrower bit that we wouldn't have to use a rock breaker but again just have a rock breaker handy and again if you can get the more powerful little beaver or groundhog hd99 i definitely recommend you do that it'll make your work a little more efficient so we're about done we're about to go on to the next step all right y'all we finished every single hole that we needed to start putting the poles both the corner poles and just the support poles in place so we got a total of 15 holes drilled out now we're gonna start getting the concrete ready and the poles and let the concrete settle overnight we'll come back tomorrow morning all the holes are drilled nice and squared up all right you guys we got all the poles concrete bags in their place ready to be put in the ground we're waiting for the uh, dog park uh, essentials as well. Just a few pieces that we're going to put in concrete here. Nathan's just cleaning out a few holes, make sure there's no excess dirt in the, in the hole. So we make. So one point too here is that they're using quickcrete concrete. Um, we go back and forth between quickcrete and sackcrete, really depending on which supply house is closer. Uh, but the point being that prepackaged concrete, I'm a big fan of it. It's consistent concrete in every single hole. Um, when I was a kid, when we were, when I was on the set crew, we mixed by hand. And mixing by hand, you can come up with some pretty inconsistent concrete, right? So, you know, if whatever ratio you're using, four to one or whatever, uh, it can become inconsistent. So are we talking heaping shovels or not heaping shovels? Or is a person shoveling, listening to music and just doesn't care about the ratio? It can become pretty inconsistent. So by using a prepackaged concrete, it costs slightly more. We ran the math out. It doesn't cost significantly more than hand mixing the concrete. And you've got greater control over the end product. So uh, pretty big fan of pre-mixed concrete. And for the DIY crowd, it's incredibly easier. You don't have to worry about mixing ratios. You don't have to worry about sourcing each individual component of the concrete mix. Uh, it's as easy as mixing the concrete up, pouring in the hole, or if you dry pack, just really dumping it in and making sure you get good compaction there in the hole. Uh, but irregardless, like I said, the point being pre-mixed concrete is nice because, or pre-bagged concrete is nice uh, because it gives you consistency from the first hole to the end hole. Is it deep enough? There you go. Everything's ready. All done, Nathan? All done. All right. Okay, guys, so just a few things to have with you when you're putting these uh, terminal posts in the ground. I recommend having a knee pad. A bucket for water, of course, a face mask to keep the dust out. And as you can see here, Nathan's holding the terminal post with a post level on it. Highly recommend having that with you. And uh, now we're putting up the line to make sure that the posts are not going to be uh, not square, right? When they all settle and, and the quick crete cures. So make sure you do that. Uh, a bucket is good with water. You know, I don't know that I've seen a, a, uh, Stringline used 
when setting posts. I mean, presumably those con- those corner posts uh, were just set recently. Now, they're probably pretty firm. It's probably fine. But I would be concerned about one of those posts moving when you put some tension on it to keep your line from falling down. Uh, maybe maybe that's unfounded, uh, but it's just a concern I would have. Uh, you get about two and a half holes done here per uh, every bucket full of water if you have a hose of course have that or you can use a wheelbarrow whatever works for you um, so as you can see here we're getting them all in their place and everything's going to be cured level and squared up when it's all said and done all right y'all well, it's really dark outside but we got all the poles in the ground but they're all level and we're all done right nate yeah we done we got the poles in the concrete so tomorrow we're going to come out Cut the corner poles to 48 inches high and just these fabric support poles, the one and a quarter inch uh, pipes that we're going to come to 46 inches high. All done. See you all tomorrow. All right, y'all, here we are. We're going to cut the poles down to the length they need to be. Uh, the corner pieces are going to be cut down 48 inches. The smaller support poles, we're going to be cut down to 46 inches. Let's do it. You know, he said, he said those were inch and a quarter posts. Um, I think he probably misspoke. Typically, line posts on a four-foot fence would measure inch and five-eighths, so a little bit over inch and a half. Um, inch and a quarter wouldn't really be a standard size. So the next size uh, down from inch and five-eighths would be inch and three-eighths, which is just on the small side of inch and a half. Um, but I, I really think these are probably inch and five-eighths line posts. Okay, so here I'm using my rigid grinding slash metal cutoff wheel to cut the terminal post and the line post to their proper height. I'll have that in the description for you. Typically, you would see a band saw used rather than a grinder. Um, as you see, that grinder's thrown off quite a few sparks. The ground looks pretty dry. There is a chance that that ground could catch fire. Um, and it's just, it's just a bit safer to use a bandsaw rather than a grinder, uh, typically. It's easier to get a nice straight cut on the top as well. All right, you guys, now we got all the poles cut at the right length. And remember the main corner, bigger two and five eighths poles are at 48 inches high. And then just the support poles for the fabric. We got them down to 40. So I, I think he meant that the terminal posts were two and three eighths. Um, there's not a two and five eighths. The next size up from two and three eighths would be two and seven eighths, which would be a, what we'd call a three inch post. Um, but again, on this size project, I, I bet they're probably two and three eighths terminal post. Six inches. So Nathan's putting the brackets on so we can start getting the. We're gonna get the top poles on first and then we're gonna put the fabric on. Everything ready to get the top running poles on all the uh, support poles there. These guys come in 21 feet and you have to have at least a support pole at least every 10 feet. We're gonna go ahead and do that and then we're gonna put the fabric on, put these gates on and this uh, park will be done as far as the fence is concerned. Okay, so here we're supporting the top rails by using the eye tops on top of the line posts here. That way it keeps them from falling off the line posts, of course. And then we use the rail ends to keep the top rail uh, connected to those terminal posts, the bigger terminal posts. So we're about done here. All right, guys, so now we're going to get this fabric, the chain link fabric. We're going to get it around the entire outer perimeter. And the inner here, the 8x8. Eight eight. So that's an interesting look at how they handled the entrance into the dog park. So typically they want, when we're building a prison, we'd call this a sally port. But uh, two gates with a holding room or a holding area in the middle. Uh, the idea being you come in one gate, you shut the gate. You come in the second gate, and then you're in the dog park. So that if there's a stray runaway dog... Uh, that it, if there's only one gate, you open the gate, the dog gets out, you might not ever get that dog back. But by having a two-gate system, you make sure the first gate, the outside gate, is shut before you open the inside gate. So if that dog gets through that gate, it's still in a contained area. Two gates are going to go. 
So we're gonna show you how to get these brackets. Well, the brackets are already on the pole, but we're gonna show you how we're gonna install these uh, stress bars that go through the links of the chain link uh, fabric there and how we get it on the pole and then how we stretch it all the way across to the other end. Okay. It's interesting to see see that his fittings are already up with with uh, band bolts in them. Everyone has a different way of doing things. So we would typically have our bands on the post, but without the band bolts. So interesting to see how he, uh, how he gets the tension bar woven through there. So here we unroll the fence fabric from end to end. It's, it comes in 50 foot rolls. And uh, so we just unroll it from end to end. And then we get the tension bar and a, just a hand winch to uh, tighten up the fence fabric. Okay, so it looks like what they did was they just un unbolted the bands, put the tension bar in, and then rebolted them. Brick to where it needs to be um, from one end to the other. Usually if you squeeze the fence fabric with your hand and it doesn't give but a half inch or so, that is a good uh, indication that it's tight enough. Then these tension bars just uh, basically get attached to the terminal post with the brackets that come with the installation material that you get when you order from a fence supply company. And again, you just want to make sure everything's nice and tight and that it is uh, snugly fit to both the terminal posts and the line posts here. So we just go ahead and go through all the different um, or all the different areas there and get the tension bands in place and make sure everything's nice and snug. As you can see here, we're getting to the final few feet of fence fabric and we are going to go on to the next step. Okay, so here we finished the fence fabric installation, except for this area here, where it's the 8x8 eight, eight eight off leash area, and uh, the gates are already pre made, so we actually don't put fence fabric there. So we're just waiting for that to arrive. Um, but at this moment, yeah, the fence fabric is up, and now we're looking at the tension wire that goes along the bottom uh, between the terminal post and because that will help keep the fence fabric nice and tight and uh, snug to all the terminal posts. So one tip is we typically put the bottom wire or the tension wire or whatever you'd like to call it. We usually put it on prior to the fabric going on. Uh, that way it's sitting on the inside of the fabric ready to be secured. Um, putting it on after the wire might make this a little bit more difficult and the line post there so you just twist them around those posts and then as far as the top we use these little ties here these wire ties that go around the top rails and the fence fabric to keep those from also falling away from the top rail so these are the things we need to uh, put in place and now we're doing that just kind of going forward and you just put them uh, the top rail you put those twist wires every few feet um, and then same on the uh, it's probably going to vary by company but uh, our standards every 18 inches or less depending on depending on the layout of the line post but 18 inches or less on uh, tie wires uh, 12 inches or less on the line post the line post as well all right so let's go on to the next step okay so here we have the fence fabric completely on nice and snug and tight to the top rail the terminal post and the line post and with the bottom tension wire uh, all tied up. So uh, I'm doing another voiceover here for this clip because it's just been a really windy day then. So as you can see here, the tension wire keeps the fence nice and snug. So at, at the top, you put these uh, wires to hold the, the uh, fabric where you see the diamonds come up above the pole everywhere. That's what helps keep that in place. These just little twisty wires. And you do that every few feet. I do about three or four between uh, the posts here. Um, but it's all done. And that's how you put in the chain link fence. This is a four foot high chain link fence. All right, you guys, we're at the final stages. We got to get the, uh, they're called the dog park essentials or just the dog essentials. It's a six foot bench. These are the seating uh, sections here. Then we got a pet waste station, and then the trash can, and then a leash post that we're gonna drill the holes for. So right here, we're gonna drill three 10 inch wide holes, one for the leash post, and then two for the bench. And then we're gonna drill a six inch hole right here for that uh, pet waste station. It's basically for these bars right here. 
Okay, so here once again we're using the 10 inch auger with the little beaver to get the holes for the dog bench and then just a 6 inch auger to get um, the pet way station in place there. Uh, only 18 inches deep for this bench because we, we don't want the bench to go too low into the ground and same with the leash, uh, the leash post there. Uh, so that's it, we got those in place. We got the dog park essentials in their place. You know, I haven't seen one of those leash posts before, but that's a really good idea. I have to uh, suggest that on our next dog park. The bench, the leash post. This is where we're going to have the waste, the pet waste station. It's going to be assembled here, and that'll be done. And then that's just a trash can that sits in its place. So we just got to get these gates uh, on their hinges. All right, y'all, now we're going to put the hinges on uh, for the gate. We're just going to do this one here. Just to show you guys how to deal with both the male and the female hinges here. This is the male hinge that has a bar that comes up or a little post there, a pin. And then the female one, this is the one that receives the male end here. And then the small one clamps onto the gate itself and then the big one clamps onto the main support beam or bar here. So we'll, we'll show you guys how to do that real quick. And you can adjust them if you just hand tighten them. You can adjust them as you need until you're ready to tighten it down completely. Kind of pop into place. Now we get the female in here. Always put the uh, carriage bolt facing in so you have the smooth side out. At least that's the way we like to do it. Like that. And now he's going to hold it kind of where it matches up with the rest of the fence. And you just tighten it down. Okay, right there, guys. Okay, now we got the bottom piece down. We're on. Now we put the male piece at the top. Like that. All right, so I was waiting to see how he did the uh, top hinge. So you see people do these either way, right? So uh, the male pin hinge or the pin part of the male hinge can either go down or it can go up. Uh, the way to do it is just as he did it. You do it, you point it down. That way the gate can't be lifted off the hinges. Uh, we go back on repairs. I. I don't know why, but it seems pretty consistent that um, there, there's some guys out there that are installing those male, top male hinges facing up, and uh, it's a great way for somebody to get in the yard because really all they have to do is pick up the gate and they're in. Put the bolt through there, and if you have any specific questions, you can ask me in the comments anything you like. I'm not covering it here in the video. Okay. Good. Yeah. That's it, you got a swinging gate. Now for the latch, you get two brackets here and you set them up like this with the open parts facing down. So with the open parts facing down on these brackets, basically this hole here is gonna be the pipe on the gate. So if you watch here, put one on one side, get it behind, and one on the other, just like that. And what we're gonna do is you put the bolt through this side, that way, the tension bar will keep it from sliding out. Hand tighten it, just like that. Typically, we would sandwich the tension bar with that the gate back clamps so that it can't move in either direction. You know, in this scenario, it can, it can, it can uh, twist away from that gate post. So if that gate gets slammed enough, that latch will start, or the latch backs will start twisting around and allow that gate just to open with no problem. Uh, so if you sandwich the tension bar with those latchbacks, then it won't let it go. It won't let it move either way. And then inside the opening on the other side is where the latch goes. Have the bolts facing the same way, just like that. Put it in the top hole. Squeeze it together, just again, hand tightening it. There we go. Tighten it with your impact gun. And I tighten the back one first, almost all the way down leave this some space to tighten as well without stripping the bolt like we did last time so you don't want to do it too tight because you can smash it to where this won't go up and down easily but you also don't want it to move left and right easily too so just a little bit of a gap and you're done where well, the gate's good to go looks like they got the spacing really right on that one uh, so typically we like to leave half inch to three-quarter inch uh, between the 
back of the gate fork and the post. Uh, that way it leaves plenty of room for that gate latch to operate either way. Looks like they nailed it. Well, guys, overall, I think that was a uh, pretty straightforward fence installation with with a few differences and different, you know, ways that we would have installed it a little bit differently. But overall, I think it's a great fence install. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Also, go check out Mastering Mayhem. Looks like he's got a good channel. Uh, worth checking out, I think. He's got some good content on there. Anyway, Joe Everest, the fence expert, and I'm reminding you guys that good fences make good neighbors. I'll see you guys next time.